Tonight on The Late Debate. The classrooms are empty. What is the cost of COVID for our children's futures? Well, I'm very worried that long after the coronavirus has gone, that we will face an epidemic of educational poverty and a mental health crisis in our, our country. We speak to the chair of the Education Select Committee. Plus, juggling the jabs, we'll be asking who should be next in the vaccination queue. Good evening and welcome to The Late Debate. The government's mantra on schools is last to close, first to open, but we still don't know when pupils will be allowed back into the classroom. Robert Halfen, the MP for Harlow, is chair of Parliament's Education Select Committee. When I caught up with him earlier, we spoke first about the impact of school closures. Oh, it's huge. It has an impact on children's educational attainment, on their mental health, on their well-being, uh, safeguarding hazards. It impacts on parents too. And we know uh, that mental health problems amongst children has, have gone up enormously. The Royal Society of Paediatricians suggests that eating disorders alone have gone up by 400% since the first lockdown. And that's partly due to social isolation and the closure of schools. What damage will it do in the long term? Well, I'm very worried that long after the coronavirus has gone, that we will face an epidemic of educational poverty and a mental health crisis in our, our country. The Department for Education officials themselves have suggested that the attainment level between disadvantaged pupils and their better off peers might be as much as 75% by the time schools are fully open again and uh, education is working as normal. And even without the coronavirus, disadvantaged pupils are 18 months behind the better off pupils by the time they get to GCSE. So this is going to cause significant problems and take a long time to fix. There's been a lot of focus on teenagers doing exams, but of course six-year-olds who are losing a year of schooling now won't be out of the school system until they're 18. Even then they could still be suffering from this. Well, this is the problem. It's having an impact not just on those pupils doing exam years, but all the way through the school and education, college and university uh, system. Uh, every year it is going to impact on children. We know that uh, when schools opened in September, that some suggestions that were that children were 15 or 22 months behind in certain uh, year groups. So this is very serious. The, the government proposed a £1 billion catch-up fund, extra tuition provided for pupils working with uh, schools, that's incredibly important, but we're going to need to rocket boost that catch-up fund and relentlessly focus it on disadvantaged pupils. Your select committee heard this week that the schools might not open at half term in February as we thought they would. That must be extremely worrying. I am very worried about that. Uh, the Prime Minister said that schools should be the first to, the last to close and the first to open and we've got to mean that because every day uh, that schools are not opening, we are damaging the life chances of you know, literally millions of our young people, the coming uh, generation. What's your best guess to when they will open? So I just don't know because um, the government chief, deputy chief medical officer to our committee said they would only open schools when the evidence suggested uh, they could. Um, the Royal Society of Paediatricians said actually it might be the case that schools open even if you have restrictions going on in, in other parts of our society and economy because they pointed out the damage that this is doing to children's mental health. The Education Secretary, Gavin Williamson, has presided over some difficult decisions. There's been the exams fiasco, school meals, school laptops, uh, the uh, lateral flow testing. If you had to give him marks out of 10, what would it be? Well, I think I've learned over the past year, given what happened with the exams and grading, not to be someone who gives people grades. And I don't want to focus on individual personalities. Do you think he's up to the job? I think that he's firefighting because of the coronavirus. I think it's very difficult for any government minister. Clearly, things have gone wrong. I mean, there's no doubt about it, particularly the exams 
controversy that you highlighted. What I would like to see from the government and the Prime Minister is a route map, an educational route map out of the coronavirus for children, young people, parents, teachers, support staff, but also the NHS has a 10 year plan for health. Why on earth um, do we not have a 10 year plan for education to set out our vision, not just the route map out of coronavirus, but what we're going to do to ensure that pupils aren't being left behind, that the attainment gap between disadvantaged pupils and the better off is going to be narrowed, that we're going to make it much easier for children uh, who have special educational needs to have a genuine level uh, playing field, to address social injustice, improve skills, standards and support for the profession. Do you think Mr Williamson will survive? Well, again, this is um, something I've really tried not to do as uh, Education Committee Chair in the House of Commons is not focused on individual personalities. It's not even up to me who is Education Secretary or not. What I want to do is to help the government. Uh, my job is to scrutinise government policy and suggest ideas with my fellow committee members uh, to try and make the education system work properly because this is the most important thing we can do uh, for our children and young people. Can I ask you about your experience of coronavirus? You have cerebral palsy. You have been shielding for an awful lot of it. How's that been for you? How frustrating has it been not being able to take part in Commons debates at times? Well, I have been shielding, although I was in the Commons uh, for two or three months uh, last year before the greater restrictions came in. But um, clearly, it's, um, I, I'm lucky I have a job. Uh, I have a secure job security, at least until the general election. You know, thousands of my constituents in Harlow and millions of people across the country don't have that security and have lost their jobs and their livelihoods or have had to cut down their hours and so are losing a valuable um, income. So for millions of people it has been really tough and also I think of all those people who aren't able to shield, have to be out, the delivery uh, uh, people who deliver things to our homes, the supermarket workers, the refuse workers, the postmen and women, the NHS workers, teachers and support staff. But uh, um, clearly it is um, something I'd prefer not to be doing. I've learned to walk up my stairs when I used to have a chairlift, which is a wonderful thing. So in some ways, there's always a um, silver lining to every uh, cloud. I very much, I, I don't just want a route map out of education, but I want the Prime Minister to provide an A to Z, to literally get an A to Z out, get out there one afternoon on uh, television and say, this is, this is the route map out of coronavirus once the vaccinations uh, come through. And presumably you can't wait for your jab. The priority's got to be for elderly people and those even, you know, extre extremely clinically vulnerable, though I'm defined as one of those and people much worse off uh, than me. But of course, um, I look forward to it, as do millions of other people across our country. Rob Halford, thank you for talking to us. Now, Robert Halford's not the only person looking forward to getting his vaccine. London, it appears, is still being shortchanged, with other regions getting more doses for their over 80s and health workers. But who in London should get the vaccine once the priority groups have been jabbed? London is lagging behind the rest of the country, but its vaccination programme is slowly picking up pace. With Wembley's mass hub open, the top nine priority groups should have been jabbed with their first dose by April. Which leaves one big question. Who should come next? That's why I think we should have a debate about it. It won't be an easy decision. Choose teachers and schools could reopen. Choose the police and it's a boost for law and order. Shop workers have also had high profile political backing. I think the police, the police do a great job and I think they should be brought up there. I think all the people who are working in the public, who are involved with the public, should be vaccinated next. Police, military, definitely should get extra. They, 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 they should have been done. They should actually have been done already. More than 50 Transport for London staff have died with Covid. The transport unions think their members should be in the mix when it comes to selecting the next priority group. They are in the front line of the front line, uh, you know, with the public, uh, dealing with that. Therefore, they have, they have uh, an, appro an appropriate calling for the vaccination. And we've been very, you know, very straightforward about this. We're not ask, asking to push in any queues and nonsense like that. We're not interested, but we are. Uh, we do need, it does need to be factored in and considered. 
months ago I asked for TfL staff to be vaccinated because they come into contact with a lot of people and of course public safety is number one so we want the police to be vaccinated as well and if we're ever going to get our, our, our economy back up and running we need our children to be at school so our parents can be at work. Prime Minister. And what about our lawmakers? Inoculations all round might be one way to fill up those empty green benches. Well, to discuss what's going on in London, I'm joined in the studio by former Conservative Health Minister and Wimbledon MP Stephen Hammond, and for the Liberal Democrats by the party's Health and Social Care spokesperson, the Twickenham MP Manira Wilson. Joining our discussion is the Labour MP for Bethnal Green and Bo Roshnara Ali. Welcome all of you. Um, yes, Stephen, first of all, who's your preference to go at the top of the next uh, priority list? I think the key thing is the government has set out the priority uh, groups. I think it's key to get through the first four by the middle of February, and that clearly looks like that's going to happen. I think, as Matt Hancock has said, it might be sensible actually to think about having a discussion at that stage whether the next group of priorities are the right priorities. Uh, we've heard the case from a number of people on your VT about who should be next. I suspect that a lot of people will be saying we want to reopen schools. Uh, you've just had a VT from Rob Halford. Look at teachers. And clearly, I think the police are really in the front line. So the, the sensible time to have a discussion about whether the priority groups right are right is now because you know, come the middle of February we'll, we will have done the first four priority groups. Manira, uh, the health secretary Matt Hancock can't get a jab and he's having to self-isolate. Should politicians be in the, in the queue? Absolutely not, unless they are in one of those vulnerable groups. Um, I don't see why I, as a 42-year-old you know, uh, fit and healthy person, should be anywhere close to top of the queue. I would like to see teachers being uh, prioritised after the most vulnerable and after our health and care workers, because I think it is absolutely critical that we get schools uh, fully reopened as quickly and as safely as possible. And part of that is making sure that teachers are and, and school staff are protected. Roshnara, we heard today from the NHS that fewer than half a million Londoners have so far had the inoculation first and second uh, doses. Are you as confident as Stephen that uh, the government will hit its target? Well, look, I very much hope the government does hit its target because we all need this vaccination program to be implemented as quickly as possible. We're in constituencies like mine, day in, day out, uh, people are dying. Royal London Hospital is at breaking point and we need to get as many people vaccinated as, as quickly as possible. First of all, on the here and now, which still needs to be sorted out, the supply is still irregular. In boroughs like mine, some weeks we've got vaccinations, other weeks we haven't. That's not good enough. That needs to change. The second thing is that there are a lot of people who haven't received the vaccinations, who are very vulnerable, uh, and the take up among some groups are much lower. We're doing really well with white uh, men and women, uh, but BAME groups, uh, the take up is much lower. We need better data. And in terms of the point made about who should come next, the priority groups after that, we've got to make sure uh, as others have said, that we get the key workers who are most exposed to catching this virus, we get to them first, and that our economy and our society is opened up as quickly as possible so that the economy doesn't contract the way it has done in the last three, lo you know, three lockdowns. Stephen, have you any idea what's going wrong with the supply of doses? I mean, the mayor seems to think that the government got the distribution formula wrong. No, I don't think that's true. I mean, the mayor has been late all the way through, but we won't dis discuss his failings tonight. I think the reality is that the distribution networks are now there. I think that, as the health secretary has acknowledged, there have been some problems with supply. You've seen something uh, from Pfizer today, but it might mean there might be a little bit more shortage over the next few weeks. But none that what I well, am that's hearing... quite worrying, isn't it? Any well, shortage? It is. Of course, it's of course it's worrying. Actually, what they're doing is slightly reordering their. Uh, manufacturing, as I understand it, to deliver more in the future. The key thing, I mean, I spoke, as I'm sure Manira and Rich and I have done, with local people, uh, the local uh, CCG today to check, uh, and the numbers rolling through now are rolling through on quite an impressive basis. We heard this morning on a London call that we expect to have all the care home staff vaccinated by Sunday, uh, and I hear that NHS staff are being vaccinated locally. One of my hospitals is now doing that seven days a week for the NHS staff. So London has been a bit slower and it is true 
because of partly because of demographics we haven't done as well as some of the other regions but what is also true is the distribution networks are there it is stepping up and the supply is coming through what's your experience in Twickenham actually you've got some experience of working in the pharmaceutical industry before you came into politics uh, yes yeah, so from what I'm hearing on the ground in Twickenham uh, they are getting supply and uh, we have moved from the over 80s into the uh, under 80s but I am concerned to see the London wide figures why we're lagging behind I mean it what we really need is a lot more detailed data to show comparatively if we've got fewer over 80s as I think Stephen has, has suggested that, that proportionately that we're in line with other parts of the country we've also got to focus on some of the vaccine hesitancy amongst BAME communities as Rishanara has pointed to because we do have uh, large numbers of BAME uh, people living in the city and there's got to be a, a strong public health information campaign peer-to-peer -peer encouragement working and engaging with the faith communities and I know there are faith communities coming forward offering their volunteers who can speak multiple languages to try and help engage and get over that va vaccine hesitancy. Stephen we've heard a lot about a roadmap out of lockdown we also heard today that more than half of patients in London hospitals have Covid what do you think the route out of it should be I mean how soon should we start thinking about easing re restrictions? Well, I, I think that's extremely difficult for us sitting here. So what we should be looking at is what are the targets we're getting in each group to get their vaccination done uh, so that that will mean uh, hospitalizations decreasing? What are we looking for in terms of hospitalizations falling? What are we looking at in terms of uh, transmission rates falling? When is it safe to say from evidence from the first lockdown and internationally, if transmission rates were at a certain level, it's safer to do some of those things? But you must think be worried the about the economy. Well, of course I'm worried about the economy. Um, but equally, the two things between having a healthy population and an economy open are not divorced. They're not, they're not mutually exclusive. The key, I think, here is to make sure that next time mm. round, as we come out of the, the uh, lockdown, that actually we see it on a, a long-term and sustainable basis. We don't want to keep... Uh, allowing the virus to be suppressed by doing the actions we've done and getting it down and then allowing uh, it to go up again and the key thing now is to make sure that when we when we come out of this lockdown that vaccinations are being throughout the whole population as fast as possible and that we can reopen on a stage basis uh, on a on a, a sustainable basis as well. Rishnara, in your constituency, of course, is Brick Lane, famous for its restaurants. I mean, there must be an awful lot of anguish there among the businesses about what's going on. Well, look, the, the, the concern is about making sure that we, we open the economy, economy up in a sustainable way. And what pe businesses can see is that lives have been lost because of the confused messaging and responses last year. You know, stopping, uh, introducing lockdown too late and then opening up and then giving people very mixed messages. We need to learn from the bad decisions that were made in part last year. But one thing I would just say is, so people want the economy opened up in a safe, sustainable, careful way while lives are protected because my constituency has been very hit very hard by death rates in the first wave and as i say day in day out uh, we're dealing with deaths uh, and in the last 24 hours my caseload has involved uh, a number of deaths uh, and supporting families so one thing i would say about what we do once we uh, get the risk those who are most at risk vaccinated is that matt hancock's called for a debate that's important but it's very important that the evidence is followed and that the government doesn't politicize who gets vaccinated um, uh, in the next wave so that the people who need it the people we depend on who are most at risk are protected first and and that's very important because i think a great deal of trust has broken down over the last year the response of the national health service has been phenomenal and the vaccination program uh, of those who are doing it has been phenomenal we need to maintain that trust and build on it stephen you well, heard what rashara said i just said what rashara said i mean surely the key point in the government is not uh, politicizing it what the government is doing is setting out the priority groups based on the most vulnerable. That's why it is the over 80s. Yeah, it is why the clinical extremely it vulnerable. It is why it. NHS uh, and care staff are being done. It is why we're going down through a tier. What I was suggesting a few moments ago is that as we go through that tier, as we now look at those who we want to prioritise next, you know, when is the right time to have at least a discussion so that the government makes a decision which uh, buys into that consent that Rush and I was talking about? I'm simply saying it needs to be evidence-based. Thank, thank you, Rush Nara. Munira. I... I, I my concern is the government's banking everything on the vaccination strategy and the vaccination strategy is 
absolutely critical, important to protect us. But as yet, we don't know if the vaccine stops transmission of and the virus. And you're worried about the one dose only, aren't uh, you? But potentially, there's some mixed data around whether we uh, should be delaying the second dose uh, to 12 weeks. But my concern is alongside vaccination, we need to be breaking the chains of transmission. And that means encouraging more people to self-isolate through financial support, practical support. It might mean offering up the hotel rooms for those who are in overcrowded accommodation who can't uh, self-isolate at home. If you don't do that, then the rates will just go back up again and we'll end up back cycling through these restrictions. We can't just bank on the vaccination strategy. Can I ask all of you, assuming we're still in some form of lockdown coming up to Easter and possibly into the tier system after that, should the mayoral election on May the 6th go ahead? It's very difficult because I think Londoners will rightly want to hold this mayor to account and rightly want to have their say and there are a number of important things happening that he's putting in place that other people might want to have the chance to stop so uh, i think that it will be i think it will be difficult but i think we should in the interest of democracy having delayed it a year aim to go for may the 6th as much as possible but it's going to be very hard to campaign isn't it knocking on doors meetings Absolutely. It does make campaigning difficult, but I think uh, we do risk a real democracy deficit having already delayed by a year if we continue to delay. But it needs to be safe, so we yeah. need to wait for the experts to advise. Roshnara, how much of, is this election going to be a referendum on how the mayor has handled coronavirus? Well, look, I, I think, first of all, on the elections, I think unless we uh, reform the way we vote uh, and uh, to ensure it's COVID safe, it's going to be a challenge. And the government needs to look at how elections can be conduct conducted uh, virtually uh, or it, through electronic voting. Uh, it's a long debate, long term debate, but it needs come of age. And the second thing is, uh, I, I think the situation for city mayors has been very difficult up and down the country, as we've seen with Andy Burnham and his battles with the government. The government had, has tried to, has made some decisions and dumped um, uh, some of uh, the changes, including funding, on the London mayor. And that is very bad behaviour in terms of um, ins insisting that the, the mayor of London makes cuts when the national government won't pass on uh, the support budget support that's needed. So some of that needs to stop. And the public can see through quite a lot of that, actually, when the can government... Can I just ask Manira, uh, this, this election could also be a referendum on how the government has handled it, couldn't it? Well, absolutely it could. And uh, I think uh, the people of London will want to make their voice heard on that. Well, I'd like to say we talk about this at great length for much longer, but I'm afraid, as usual, we've run out of time. I'd like to say thank you very much to all my guests for joining us tonight. Thanks to Robert, to Stephen, Manira, Rashnara. I'll be back next month with another edition of The Late Debate. Until then, good night and thank you for watching.